When people ask where can they read real American history, one of my favorite books is These Truths by Jill Lepore, and it's written like a piece of poetry. Here's an excerpt. Quote, during his stay in Washington, Charles Dickens, who'd started out as a police reporter, he visited the House and Senate every day, sitting in the galleries, taking notes. Quote, both houses are handsomely carpeted, he allowed, and the Senate was dignified and decorous. Its deliberations conducted with much gravity and order. But meetings at the House of Representatives, he said, were the meanest perversion of virtuous political machinery that the worst tools ever wrought. Its members were cowardly, petty, cussed, and degraded. Dickens, for all the flair of his pen, had by no means exaggerated. Although hardly ever reported in the press, the years between 1830 and 1860 this is just prior to the Civil War, saw more than 100 incidents of violence between congressmen, from melees in the aisles, to mass brawls on the floor, from fistfights and duels to street fights. Quote, it is the game of these men and of their profligate organs, Dickens wrote, to make the strife of politics so fierce and brutal and so destructive of all self-respect and worthy men that sensitive and delicate-minded persons shall be kept aloof, and they, and such as they be, left to battle out their selfish views unchecked. In other words, reasonable people were kept out of politics entirely. Doesn't sound that different than now. Dickens knew a rogue when he heard one, and a circus when he saw one. Nearly as soon as the war with Mexico began, Members of Congress began debating what to do when it ended. They spat venom. They pulled guns. They unsheathed knives. Divisions of party were abandoned. And the splinter in Congress was sectional. Before heading to the Capitol every morning, Southern congressmen strapped Bowie knives to their belts and tucked pistols in their pockets. Northerners, on principle, came unarmed. When Northerners talked about the slave power, they meant that literally. If the United States were to acquire territory from Mexico, and if this territory were to enter the Union, would Mexicans become American citizens? Senator Calhoun, a slaver from South Carolina, opposed this idea, saying, quote, I protest against the incorporation of such a people. Ours is the government of the white man. And what about the territory itself? Would those former parts of Mexico enter the Union as free states or slave? In 1846, David Wilmot, a 32-year-old Democratic congressman from Pennsylvania, who looked as meek as a schoolmaster, suggested that a proviso be added to any treaty negotiated to end the war, decreeing that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any territories acquired through the war with Mexico. In 1846, the Wilmot proviso passed 83 to 64 in the House, a vote that fell entirely along sectional rather than party lines. The Massachusetts abolitionist and staunch opponent of the war, Charles Sumner, predicted the proviso was going to lead to a new crystallization of the parties in which there shall be one grand northern party of freedom. Supporters of the Wilmot proviso argued slavery and democracy could not coexist. It is not a question of mere dollars and cents, said one Wilmot supporter in the House. It's not a mere political question. It is one in which the North has a higher and deeper stake than the South possibly can have. It is a question whether in the government of the country, she shall be borne down by the influence of your slave-holding aristocratic institutions that have not in them the first element of democracy." End quote. Jill Lepore is making the point again and again and again that the central conflict in all of American history has been and still is the issue of slavery. 